Welcome to the NREM Podcast, where we discuss the law for real estate investors. Andy and Sean are both attorneys. Nothing said in this discussion should be considered legal advice. We're simply providing information and education. You should consult with an attorney in your state regarding any specific legal issue that you may have. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the show. Today, our topic is understanding and establishing business lines of credit. I'm Andy Fowler, and I'm here with Sean St. Clair. If you're new to the show, give us a like. Make sure to subscribe to the channel. We're on Facebook. We're on YouTube. Go to the channel, like it, subscribe, give us your feedback. We'd love to hear it uh, and love to have you follow. With that, we're going to go to Sean, who's going to give us our legal update for today. Thank you, Andy. So today I want to talk about uh, subject to addendums. Um, so for those investors out there that are watching this that uh, intend to purchase property or do in fact purchase property um, subject to existing loans, um, I recommend uh, that in addition to the purchase contract that lays out uh, the terms of any type of seller carryback financing, wrap agreement or otherwise, um, that if the property is being subject to the existing loans, that a subject to addendum be incorporated with and uh, accompany that purchase contract. Now, what is a subject to addendum? So a subject to addendum is basically an addition to the contract that lays out and discloses the exact nature of the transaction as well as provides disclosures to the seller as to what it means to have the loans remain in place while the new buyer takes title to the property. One of the defenses that uh, we've we've seen sellers use um, in dealing or or try to use uh, in 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 uh, trying to claim well you know I don't have to perform under the contract because. I didn't fully appreciate or understand the nature of the subject to transaction. Well, the subject to addendum eliminates that because the subject to addendum goes line by line uh, with the seller where the seller initials to basically explain that and, and, and the seller acknowledges that they understand the nature of the transaction. So for example, the seller understands that the loan is going to remain in place and still show on their credit. They understand that the uh, if if the loan payments are not made um, by the buyer, that um, you know that's going to potentially cause damage to the credit. That the loan's not being paid off. That the seller or not the seller, the lender may um, have a right to at that point, if if the property is transferred, have the right to invoke the due on sale clause, and what it means if the due on sale clause is invoked. So it has all of these disclosures uh, that the seller basically initials and it, they're, you know, one sentence disclosures, basically laying out the nature of the transaction so that if the seller comes back later on and says, oh, I, I didn't fully appreciate that. I thought that I was just selling it outright, that, that this was being paid off, et cetera. I say, no, you signed a subject to addendum, you initialed each line here, which basically explained in, you know, detail and, you know, pretty simple terms the nature of this transaction and you acknowledged and agreed that you understood that you appreciated the the transaction and that um, you were aware of the the nature and the risks of the transaction so i recommend uh that anytime that a property is being purchased subject to that there be some form of addendum accompanying that purchase contract that allows or has the seller make these um acknowledgments and details and explains the transaction, but not only for the seller, but it's also beneficial for um, a buyer if that contract is going to be assigned. So a lot of times an investor will uh, put a contract or put a property under contract uh, with a subject to a structure with the idea that they're going to assign it to another investor who will then actually perform under the contract. And then that um, original buyer would would take an assignment fee for the assignment to the end uh, buyer. Well, you want to make sure that that end buyer fully understands and appreciates the nature of the transaction. And so if you do 
or, or put together a purchase contract. It has all of the seller carryback terms, et cetera, but it doesn't exactly lay out the nature of the subject to transaction. Well, then that end buyer could come back and say, well, I didn't fully understand that it was subject to, I thought, you know, that, uh, it was being paid off with seller carry or whatever the case may be. Um, but the subject to addendum contains all those disclosures. And so as you and I know, an in buyer um, and, or an assignee of a contract basically takes the contract as though they were the original buyer. And so all those initials and all those signatures on that subject to addendum will be imputed and deemed to be knowledge of the end buyer and the end buyer basically stands in the shoes of the original buyer and says, Oh yeah. You know, uh, where the original buyer said, yeah, I understand the nature of the transaction as well. That end buyer is deemed to fully appreciate or understand the nature of the transaction. Well, and sometimes the value of, of what you're offering has a lot to do with uh, how well you prepared the documents on one end. So what I mean by that is if you are the, you're looking to assign this in the future, right? If you've documented this properly and you're trying to sell to other selling uh, savvy investors, they're going to know whether this is good or what they're stepping into the shoes of. And if you didn't document this properly, you've got a transaction that's just not worth as much. Exactly. Yep. That's exactly right. All right, Sean. Thank you for the legal update today. With that, we're going to get into the substance of the show. And again, our topic today is it's all fun and games until you get the bill, nailing that line of credit. So we're talking about business lines of credit as opposed to just standard personal lines of credit. And today, uh, to talk with us about uh, the subject of business lines of credit is Tommy Thornburg. Tommy is the pre president of Prime Corporate Services. Tommy, thanks so much for joining us. Of course. Thank you for having me. It's Good that we get to chat and get together. It's it's nice to finally finally meet you and be able to talk to you guys. Yeah, it's awesome to have you. Tommy, tell us about Prime Corporate Services. Prime Corporate. We've been in business for uh, about 10 years now, 10 years a couple months ago. And we help people with entity structure and business credit development, um, tax filings. So small business owners, business owners in general, and helping build business credit as a whole. Now give Sean and I and our listeners an idea. How'd you get into this line of work? How'd you get in, in involved in business planning? Great question. So when I was 18 years old, I drove from Utah, Salt Lake City, Utah, where we're based to North Carolina. And I started knocking door to door selling pest control. Uh, made a pretty decent amount of money in three months as an 18 year old and came home and had a big old tax bill that I didn't know what to do with. So my mom was a real estate agent. My dad owned a real estate brokerage. They were adamant on me being self-employed my whole life. And I came across Steve Harward, who's the CEO of Prime. And he was working with a company that offered the services that we do now. Um, I just became obsessed with helping business owners understand. I mean, you guys have clients that obviously need the legal services, but I, I'm not a CPA. I'm not an attorney. I'm just an investor and an entrepreneur that didn't have the resources to hire these high power CPAs and attorneys. So figuring it out and bootstrapping it until we could hire a team of accountants and CPAs and um, attorneys is kind of how this whole thing came about. So let's start really from the beginning when talking about credit. You know, the casual observer, uh, the casual consumer knows that we have this thing called credit. We know we have credit scores. Um, not many have gone beneath the service to know that credit is really essentially the creation of money and it, it's, a, it's a big industry. But as we have individual credit as we know it, there is business credit. There are, um, and there are business credit scores, so on and so forth. How would you kind of characterize uh, for somebody, either maybe a real estate investor just looking to get into the business side of things? What, how, how would you characterize business credit as opposed to you know your common consumer-based credit? The first two things that I like to say about credit is building credit is not rocket science. It's a process, not only for your personal, but for your business as well. 
And the second thing that I would say to it is it takes time, right? So for everybody, everybody has a legal name, a social security number, and a credit score. And you can do the same thing for the business. Make sure you have the business name, get that EIN number, but you can build and develop what's called a pay deck score for your business, a separate credit profile to be able to separate the personal and the business from a financial standpoint. And uh, just like having good personal credit, oftentimes it makes your life a whole lot easier. Having good business credit in most cases is going to make your business life easier at some point. Now, I know we'll get into this uh, a little bit throughout the program, but establishing a good business line of credit, uh, do the same principles attach to that they would as to the consumer, meaning uh, if I'm responsible and I pay my bills uh, on time and as they're meant to be paid, I'll, I will be rewarded with a better credit score? A, a lot of the principles are very, very similar for sure. And I think that the major difference and I tell this story all the time, but how nice would it have been when you were 16 years old if someone said, I'm going to make sure that when you're 18, that you have a 750 credit score, right? When you're 16, you feel like it doesn't matter. But when you're 18 and you need your first credit card, car loan, student loan, whatever it may be, you understand the impact of interest rates and how beneficial that is very early. And I think it's the same thing for the business. Even if you're just getting started, building business credit and having additional lines of funding is probably going to come into play and be a benefit at some point, right? So the major difference that I will tell you, personal credit, they start judging you off that credit history right off the bat. Business credit is something that we more so have to apply for. We have to build and we have to maintain. So there's a little bit more awareness that goes into building business credit, but fundamentally paying your bills, using your lines of credit, increasing the credit lines is ultimately very similar. Tommy, who who tracks uh business credit? I know, you know, we have Equifax, Equinox, TransUnion for the personal line. Um but are those same companies the ones that track it for uh, businesses or is there separate companies that do that? So Dun & Bradstreet, this is a sensitive subject for me because Dun & Bradstreet has pretty well monopolized business credit, right? A lot of times you go and get your Dun's number to build up the Paydex profile and then you start that reporting. Um, it's similar in the sense of having the different credit bureaus, but uh, Dun & Bradstreet has pretty well monopolized business credit to build up a credit profile to get additional lines of credit. So you mentioned, you mentioned a number. So I, I take it from that, that there is some sort of number that's associated with a business credit score. How, how does that scale work or compare to what we would be used to in the consumer context with a, a, what would be a low score and what would be a high score? Is it similar? Yeah, so there's, I, I mean, I would say that there's, to answer the question directly, a Paydex profile ranges from one to 100. And to give you the visual, 80 to 85 would be like someone personally having a 750 to an 800. But I think that a great way to look at this is if we were to break down six steps of building business credit, Having a business entity is number one. Making sure you have the EIN number being number two. Open up the business bank account, number three. Number four is where you start to get some starter accounts. Number five, you can start to get some business credit cards. And then eventually you work yourself into these lines of credit, which is ultimately what people want but those oftentimes take a little bit longer to develop. At, at what point along that spectrum does, does some history matter? And to kind of put you, put it into context, when you talk about getting, getting the business credit card and then working into the business line of credit, I kind of think of myself as the 18 year old 
who was just getting out of high school and going to get my first car. And what did the lender say? They said, you have no credit history. Go get your dad, bring him here so he can guarantee this loan. And then you're going to establish, uh, you're going to establish some sort of credit history. And then you had to go back to your parents and then your parents refused to do it. And that's a whole nother story behind that. But, you know, there, there was this process to, that even for some of the small stuff, you had to have some sort of some sort of history. Is it not really in the business context till you till you until you start getting into bigger lines of credit where lenders are typically really concerned about a, a lot of history? Is it easy on the front end for businesses to start developing some of that initial basic stuff with uh, bank credit cards? It certainly makes it a whole lot easier, right? Making money and having good credit makes everything a whole lot easier. Those problems are a lot easier to manage, no matter what side it's on, personal or business. I would say the major difference is when you're building business credit, you can start the credit profile regardless of your credit history personally. So good credit, bad credit, no credit. It's almost worse to have no credit than bad credit in a lot of cases because it's harder to pr prove that you've done anything with loans and different things of that nature. But with business credit, there are a lot of similarities. I mean, naturally, if you think about a bank or if you think about risk, someone that makes money or has been in business longer and has that history is naturally going to get larger lines of credit or more opportunities. But I'd say the major difference is you can start to build that credit profile when you first start your business. And I think that's a benefit because once you're a year, two years, five years down the road, you have that history. So I'll talk to investors and entrepreneurs all the time that'll say, Tommy, I've been in business for 10, 20 years. I wish I did this 10, 20 years ago. Of course, but here we are. And you at least have that 10, 20 years of history. So good or bad, profit or loss, building the history is something that's going to benefit you, just like the personal credit. So starting from scratch, you know, we, we have the LLC, it's formed, uh, attains the EIN, opens a bank account. At what point or how long on average does it take before the credit is in good enough condition where that business can go out and obtain, say, a line of credit of, of some substantial amount, you know, 50, hundred, you know, thousand dollars type of thing. I see that. I see that mm -hmm. Effie's in here in the chat. Effie, I hope you're doing great. Um, she knows that I'm going to come with this right now and I'm going to say everyone's situation is different. I have to give the disclosure here that I cannot guarantee any amount of money on the credit side, but I can guarantee that you can build business credit. So to that point, we have a credit program that is 12 months that teaches and shows you how to get those starter accounts. So not all accounts are created equal. There's some accounts that report on a, on a yearly basis. There's some accounts that report on a quarterly basis. There's some accounts that report on a monthly basis, biweekly and even weekly. So depending on the starter accounts that you receive in the beginning, it can definitely expedite that process to where we're looking to get an 80 to an 85 within three to six months where you can start to get actual business credit cards. But usually the lines of credit are going to be a year to two years down the road. Straight to your point of what does the history matter, right? So starter accounts, business credit cards, then lines of credit, and that will come in different time frames as you build up the Paydex profile. And I've seen people get a thousand dollars, five thousand dollars. I've seen the rare circumstance of hundred thousand dollar lines of credit in that first three to six month period. But what is your credit profile? What accounts did you build to expedite that process? And what banks and lenders are offering? what depending on the industry makes a massive difference here so if i wanted to go and check my personal credit score i can do 
I don't know, what is it? Creditreport.com or some thing where I get a free credit score, you I know, know anything like yeah, that. What, whatever, but you know, and I can go and then my lender, when they pull, if, if I'm applying for a loan, they'll send me, you know, my credit stuff. Is there somewhere where a business owner can go a website? Um, maybe it's done in Bradstreet's website where they can go and plug in their businesses EIN and find out how they're doing on, you know, building that business credit. Yeah, absolutely. You can check it on Dun and Bradstreet, but my personal favorite is nav.com, nav.com, and I really like that one because you can pay a monthly subscription and it'll report to your credit profile as well. So, nav.com is a personal preference to check the score, see where you are, see what you would qualify for, but you can check it on Dun and Bradstreet for no cost as well. I think nav.com is like $20 a month or something, but it's tax deductible and it's a, a lot more user friendly of what you would qualify for moving forward. I love nav.com. It's a great website. So Tommy, it's talking still about the kind of the introductory phase of a business, the early stage, this, this podcast is designed for real estate investors. And many of those might be new to the space and maybe they're just thinking about creating a business. And we've done a number of shows about how to structure businesses properly and dealing with multiple owners. So you've mentioned this just briefly, but to what extent, when if I'm starting a new business with a partner, to what extent is my individual credit history or my potential partner's individual credit history going to factor into this equation? And by credit history, I really mean negative credit history, because obviously positive is only going to help. But to what extent early on is that going to be a factor that needs to be overcome or is it a factor at all? It is a factor. It's always a factor. But I would say that the major factor that goes into this, and thank you for the question, because it's something that we get asked all the time, really. But the major factor is time. If you have poor personal credit, it's going to make it more difficult and limit your options on the starter accounts that you can apply for to effectively build the Paydex profile, which in turn is going to make that. Remember when I said that you have the quarterly, the monthly, and the different accounts that have the different reports. If you have bad personal credit, a lot of the accounts that report on the shorter timeframes will not allow you to apply for those starter accounts but there are still options. So the time frame is gonna be the major factor in building up larger lines of credit in a shorter period of time. So let's talk about as the, build, as the business itself starts to grow and maybe be in need for more lines of credit. You know, when Sean and I started, our own personal business story was one where we, we, we started during the last recession really, and our goal was to keep it uh, small, uh, efficient, keep costs down, all those kind of things. So we, and we wanted to keep liability really to a minimum. So we weren't really thinking about going out and get, getting major loans or anything else. We wanted to live within our means and do all those kind of things. But as we grew, it's not that we re, not that we suddenly realized, well, we, we need to go get more money, but as you grow in the machine, so to speak, it's bigger. Uh, there's things like payroll, there's all kinds of expenses you want to have to, to take care of the things in the event, maybe you had a bad month or a bad quarter or whatever else. And you have this level of responsibility for maybe lots of employees or, or whatever the case may be. What, what would, should a new business that maybe has got six months under their feet, they've formed it, they've opened the bank accounts. Maybe they got the the business credit card at the local bank, um, and they're using that to pay monthly expenses and paying that down. What what would you say to the business that business that maybe five years out from that point might be looking at maybe fifteen employees and 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 in a spot where they would need a larger line of credit and need to be in a position to apply for and get that kind of line of credit? What what would they need to start thinking about doing? I'm going to fall off my chair when you say entrepreneurs are thinking five years into the future. <laughs> they never do. <laughs> but for sake of conversation, let's talk about it. Um, the best time to ask for money is when you don't need it. 
right? Not only personally, but I think business wise as well. So I believe that there's going to be a lot of opportunities real estate wise coming up here shortly. So I have intentionally got home equity lines of credit personally. I've extended personal credit lines. Um, I've extended and lowered interest rates any way that I, I possibly can on the personal side. I'm also doing the same thing for the business. You don't know when your growth is going to happen. You don't know when the opportunity is going to present itself. But we do know that having good personal credit and having good business credit will make your life easier, right? In those circumstances. So the sooner that you can build that credit profile and the more that you can grow those credit lines as you don't need it or even as you do, the better position you're going to be in from a financial opportunity standpoint when those opportunities present themselves. So the sooner the better in building good credit profiles on both sides, personal and business. Well, and I want to just kind of piggyback what Andy was saying about our firm and and then what you were saying about uh, establishing and, and obtaining that credit when you don't need it. Um, uh, our firm is a, a prime example or the way we, we grew. Like Andy said, we were very conservative. Um, but there came a point where Andy and I both recognized, hey, our payroll is growing a little bit. And if we have a slow month or quarter, um, you know, we may need a line of credit. And so we put it in place and probably for about two years, we never used it. Um, and then there came a period uh, after that, uh, basically one quarter where our AR just was not what it needed to be. And now we knew we had some uh, amounts out there that were going to come through. Like th it wasn't much of a question. It was just, you know, when was it going to come through and we needed it. And we actually, you know, had to dive into that line of credit um, for two payroll cycles to make payroll. And then of course those amounts came through, we paid off the line of credit. We haven't had to use it since knock on wood, but you know, what would have happened had we, you know, not obtained that, right. Our firm would have had. Oh, you cut out on us. Yeah. Again. Sean, Sean cut out, but where he was going with that obviously is what, yeah. What would we have done had, you know, had those, uh, not been there. And, and to your point, uh, we considered and looked into a line of credit at a time when we didn't actually technically need it. Uh, we hadn't really thought about it. It was just kind of a time where it was like, well, this seems like a good practice, business practice to have. This is probably something we should, we should look at, uh, look at doing. Um, so as when you say, Business should be thinking about this right now, you know. Th um, so for a business that's maybe six months in, is is this process of thinking about this right now really just kind of fa a phase up process? Meaning, do what you can do now, and as you can do more, do more. Is that is that kind of the idea? As you grow with more history, and banks are willing to lend more, start with what you can do and just get bigger. That's what I would recommend in any circumstance, especially with the business as a whole. I mean, crawl crawl before you walk, walk before you run, have that comfort level of understanding what you're doing. But if you're building up a credit profile for starter accounts and business lines of credit in the very beginning, I believe once an entrepreneur, always an entrepreneur to some extent. So why not build those credit lines from the beginning so that even if you pivot, let's say to a different industry, you still have those open lines of credit or as you grow within the industry you're in or within real estate, all you're doing is extending those credit lines. I think it's a great idea no matter how long you've been in business. Now, now, as a general rule, is a business building a credit profile if it has a line of credit but is not drawing from it, just meaning it's available to it? Or, or does the business have to draw upon the line of credit and create, you know, repayment history and all that stuff to be to begin building that profile? Or can you just basically have something like we did for safety and, and then it just sat there and we basically didn't use it for most of the time and still don't? I see what you're saying. It, it totally depends on the bank and it depends on the type of line of credit. But um, same thing that I just talked about. I, I can't tell anyone what to do financially. Like the, 
disclosure said, but what I can say is I have open lines of credit that aren't being used. And I'm sure the two of you are still conservative and you're still, you know, extending those lines of credit, knowing what happened to you years ago. And we're in the same boat being conservative and, and stacking those funds up for the opportunities is always a good idea, but you don't have to constantly use those once you've built them. I do recommend using them here and there because it makes it a lot easier to be considered to extend those lines of credit every six, six months to a year. Um, and obviously I do this all day, every day, and I'm a bit ridiculous with it, but I have calendar updates in my phone that will go off every six months or every year. And I'll call the number on the back of the credit card and say, Hey, it's been six months. It's been a year. Are we extending my credit lines? Are we giving me more rewards? Or are we lowering, lowering my interest rate? Right. At the end of the day, these credit card companies really want your business. And that's why they offer you 0% transfer rates so that they can take the debt load, assuming that you're not going to pay the debt load off. Right. That's how they're making money is, is, is having that money and being able to compound interest. So if we think like the bank and we know that they want the money and they want the debt load and we're smart about the interest rate, there's a lot of opportunities to extend those credit lines. So what so does the... What what does the underwriting process generally look like for uh, with a lot of these lenders? As uh, well, let's let's take a step back and talk about what kind of lines of credit or 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 credit accounts are offered by lenders that you would generally be putting uh, or encouraging new businesses to take part in uh, that help build that credit profile like the starter accounts of kind of where, where you begin once you get your DUNS number. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. The kind of things that the new business should be looking at stacking and basically building. So to, to get things started, it's oftentimes the ones that you don't want, like staples and lows and um, th those types of accounts. But once you can get into business credit cards, I think that major banks are going to naturally have more benefit long-term all of my major bank cards have much larger lines of credit than any of the local credit unions or anything like that that I've used in the past. Um, so I think the major banks are great to build the relationship with early so that you can look at getting those larger lines of credit and have a history with those banks over time. Got it. Tommy, I want to jump back to what you mentioned um, before, as far as um, utilizing the lines of credit. Um, I know personally back when the great recession happened, I had a equity line against my house and the lender came back and said, Oh, we're shutting it down. <laughs> like you're shutting it down. The property has plenty of equity. Of course, you know, I wasn't smart and I was uh, trying to reduce the interest. So I was kind of making it my savings account, if you will. Right. Um, so I had put a bunch of our savings in there and said, ah, oh, well, if something goes wrong, I can, you know, pull it out. Uh, and you know, it forced me to sell the property and get the equity out and whatever, which was unfortunate, but, uh, have you seen or experienced that same thing on business lines of credit where if the economy, you know, starts going towards, you know, a recession or, you know, uh, having issues, maybe even as we're seeing now, where that lender may come in and say, yeah, you know, we have that $150,000 line of credit, but uh, we're just not feeling real good right now. So we're, we're shutting it down. Um, does that happen on the business side as well? All the time, all oh, the man. time. It's, you know, they have the ability to do that, unfortunately. Um, when COVID first hit, I had a lot of clients that experienced that where credit lines were reduced. But as I started to dive into it more, it's because of some sort of payment history, right? There was a higher risk for those individuals where you go back to when you had to sell that and they did that to you. They didn't do that to you when um, COVID happened because you're established, because you've built the credit profile. Mm -hmm. So the lower that your risk is as a person and as a business owner, and with those credit profiles, the less likely that that is to happen. But I do see it happen, unfortunately, 
Um, and that's why I think it's important to build it up sooner than later, but also build it up and continue to utilize it. Um, I had it happen to me. I had a Wells Fargo card that I didn't use for 10 years and I totally forgot about it. I got a, ma- a, a piece of mail saying that they had closed out the account. Forgot about the card. I wish that I had used it and kept it open, but live and learn, right? That was my kind of eye opener to, to make sure that I am using cards. Um, and even on the personal side, right? I'll do auto payments on cards that I don't want to use. I'll put an auto payment on there and just have the auto payment so that I get the notification. I understand. I think it's a good idea to use open lines of credit so that you show the activity, you keep the lines of credit open, and you have the ability to extend those over time. How do you counsel or do you counsel um, businesses in, in preparing for what the under uh, underwriting process might look for like with different types of lenders or different types of banks. And I, I, I guess where I'm going with this is our own experience and is we've, we've met with banks in our business that were very hands off, right? Maybe, maybe you would experience this with a big bank. Yeah, you, it looks good. We're going to lend it. Have fun, go with God and make sure to make your monthly payment kind of thing. And that that's it. Um, and we've, we've met with other banks, smaller banks that were very friendly. Uh, but we got the, we, we w- were in one circumstance where it, it felt like we needed to go build like a mother-in-law suite and have the bank kind of like move in, you know, it was like, we were bringing on a whole nother partner on this loan kind of thing. And it was like, well, you know, I, I like you, but I'm not sure I like you that much, you know? So it, it, do you see in the underwriting process? Uh, different degrees of kind of lender involvement uh, along this line? Are there some lenders that are, or banks that are preferable for businesses that you found over time? What, what have you seen there? Not all banks are created equal. <laughs> That's the first thing that I will say. Another thing that I will add to that is um, it changes, right? And I'll, get, I'll give you an example. I had someone from American Express reach out to me about five years ago, trying to get me to send a lot of the clients to American Express. We focus on building business credit. We don't do a lot on the personal credit side. It's something we've considered, but we haven't really gone into the personal credit side. And when the American Express representative reached out to me, they let me know that they don't do anything on the business credit side. So I said, I I don't think this is going to be a fit. We ended up parting ways. Called me back three years later, and this is right when COVID was hitting. And he said, hey, we're lending to businesses now, and we're not lending as much to personal because businesses were a lower risk factor, right? American Express makes more money off of personal debt loads and interest rates than they do the business side. And uh, when that changed, that risk tolerance for them changed and their business model changed. So major banks, I oftentimes see larger lines of credit over time. Smaller banks, uh, credit unions, a lot of times they are gonna put you through the ringer But some banks want to lend to shopping malls, subways, real estate. The type of business and the bank and the track history are always going to vary. Um, And I think asking those questions to the lender are important before you go and decide to sign over your firstborn like you experienced at the credit union in comparison to the major bank. So it sounds like it's it's heavily dependent on whether you fit within that that bale or basket of products that that bank likes to give money to. And so determining that process, is it, is that just a process of essentially interviewing banks or is, um, is there another way to go about that as a business owner? I think interviewing banks is definitely important, but I will say that someone that knows what they're doing and, and works in the business credit realm it's something that we do, and I've got credit advisors that are doing it all day long that can help you and point you in the direction of what lenders are going to be best. But in addition to that, I think that something like a nav.com, as I mentioned earlier, is going to give you some of those opportunities based off of the type of business that you're operating. So that that is the type of, one of the type of services that uh, your company could could assist with. 
Correct. Yep. And like I said, I I could go into saying right now we're seeing larger lines of credit with Bank of America or Chase. But by the time someone listens to this in a month, three months, six months, it could be totally different. Last month, if you were opening up a business account with Chase while applying for a line of credit, we were seeing on average a $5,000 larger line of credit. Why? I don't know, because they wanted the additional accounts and there was a push. There's a lot of times not necessarily a rhyme or reason as to why banks will change what they're going to lend and why, but it does change. And I think that's important to understand that if you tell yourself, I like this local credit union, I've been with them for 10 years, this is who I use, you're going to limit your opportunity for lines of credit. Now we've talked about lines of credit. Um, what's the difference between say a line of credit and going and obtaining say an SBA loan? Um, what, what, what's the difference there? What does each look like as far as application and um, the loan and the terms and you know requirements, that type of thing? So loans and grants are going to oftentimes take a lot longer and they're going to go under a lot more scrutiny for the approval process. For the starter accounts, for the credit cards, for the lines of credit, if you build those up, it oftentimes makes it a lot easier from an SBA loan standpoint if you have those ducks in a row with the business name, the EIN, and the Paydex profile. So building business credit and establishing lines of credit, they're totally different, but oftentimes they will play a toll in getting a higher chance of approval if you've proven your your credit history by establishing that Dun & Bradstreet profile. Are there certain loans that allow for a business to be sold easier with the loan in place? Meaning, you know, let's say I build up a business Oh, you're cutting out on us again. You got to you got to shorten that mic. I I understand the question though. I and I I'll just jump into it and answer it. I I don't know. I I it's probably something that I should know, but I I honestly don't know the answer to that question. I've got some resources I could probably ask, and I'm sure that there are ways that if you apply through those loans with the business name, the EIN and the Paydex, when you merge or when someone acquires that business, there's ways to make it transferable. But I couldn't tell you off the top of my head what that would look like or who that would be. Now, I want to talk briefly about secured loans versus unsecured loans. Um, when a business might, when, no, not a business rather, but the lender, when would the lender rather require uh, that the loan be secured, let's say, by like the assets of the business. It could certainly be secured by some sort of other asset. If it was a real estate investor, maybe real estate. Um, will will the credit score of the business factor into this decision, or is, is this just determined secured versus unsecured based on the type of the loan? It depends on the loan. It depends on the bank. But here's what I will tell you. A lot of times, once again, I'll talk to people and they'll say, Tommy, I've got a business credit card and I haven't established my Paydex profile. It's a personal credit extension. At some point, they've put their assets or their social security number in the process of applying for that line of credit. If it reports back to your personal credit, if you have assets that are tied to it, it's going to be tied to it. So the good news is, you know when you're applying. If you only used your business name, the EIN, and the Paydex profile, then you're tying that together with the credit itself. We had a concern a couple years ago, and even, I mean, it's still a problem up till this day. There's a Privacy Act, I believe it was 1974 when it came out. And that Privacy Act said that you basically, there's no financial information of any kind that can be released by financial institutions without prior written consent. 
So oftentimes banks and lenders are still going to want your personal information. They're still going to want your personal name. They're probably still going to want your address. But did you use your social and did you tie together assets for that line of credit? And that usually can answer the question of what your liability is between secure and unsecured. Um, same thing. When I bought my first car with my business, they made me secure that with the amount of money that was in my account. My last vehicle, it was a free for all, take it, right? So based off of your risk tolerance and your longevity, that answer will absolutely change. Uh, another kind of follow up to this is um, in terms of building your, your credit profile, your business credit profile, do things like um, your landlord tenant agreement, if you're leasing space, help factor into that? Or is that not something that would typically be reported? Uh, if, they're, if they're reporting it, there's ways that it can be reported for sure. There's, um, for instance, in Utah, we have a company, it's, it's called Rentler, and they go through the background checks and they do all these additional things that actually report to the credit bureaus. But a lot of times that's going to cost the landlord money and are they going to do it? So if they're reporting, it can impact those things. Yes. What about, and I think the lesson here is, you know, build your credit history, be a good, be a good business, pay your bills and continue to build it up. Um, and sh we've, we've spoken about examples. Sean and I gave our, our firm as an example and some of our, our credit history, but not all businesses start out the same way. So for us, it was a law firm. Uh, Sean and I didn't require a lot of equipment or inventory and everything else. What, what we sell is in our head. Um, and we didn't need a lot to be able to do that computers and everything else, but, uh, maybe a real estate investor who's looking to make a large acquisition on the front end, maybe a restaurant, right? That's a classic example. I can't just start a restaurant out of my little office with a computer. I need lots of equipment, lots of furniture, lots of inventory, and very few restaurateurs, some obviously, but very few start out with a giant sum of cash to be able to go purchase those. So what do you do and how do you counsel young businesses that are just starting out that are going into kind of a, a market that's going to require some a lot of front end exposure? I think it would have been a good idea for the two of you to be a consulting or a marketing company and have a law firm on the side. That probably would have helped those lines of credit. But uh, I, I think consulting and marketing are two massive areas that nowadays everyone's doing it. Look at what we're doing right now in regards to marketing and consulting. And sure. there's a lot more areas of opportunity in those two, those are the first two that come to mind to answer your question. Um, but consulting and marketing are great. Naturally, real estate is going to cost money, but a lot of banks and lenders don't love real estate depending on the economy and depending on the market. Consulting and marketing is open, it is indirect, and it's something that all of us are doing this day and age. One other mm -hmm. area, area in talking about kind of secured positions lenders might take should should new business owners early on as they're starting to build their profile expect the lender to require that they or at least early on personally guarantee some of the financing that the business is is going to be undertaking um depending on what you're looking for and what your goal is i think it's a i think it's a fair and realistic expectation to your point to just understand that that's gonna help build the credit profile. But if you're starting slow, if you're going through building up your starter accounts, if you have time, um, no, you don't necessarily have to do that. But I do think for probably 95% of entrepreneurs, having the expectation of a little bit of a personal guarantee in the beginning is a very realistic expectation. Is it gonna give them more options on the front end, do you think? Absolutely. 100% it will. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's where, and that's what I did when I first started building my credit profile. I didn't care that I had a little bit of a personal guarantee in the beginning because there's more accounts that I actually wanted. There's a lot of accounts that if you don't use your credit, not only do you not want them, but you're not going to want to extend them over time. 
I'd rather personally guarantee in the beginning, report to the credit bureaus and report to NAV and report to my Paydex profile so that I have them long term to eventually be able to build up that credit profile. Very interesting. Well, Tommy, the information has been awesome. Thanks so much for being with us, Tommy. Uh, tell us and our listeners where where you where they can find you, uh, where your presence is online, and how they can get with you. Yeah, absolutely. Prime Prime Corporate Services, everything. So Prime Corporate Services, Facebook, Instagram. Um, I believe we have a link as well that we'll we'll drop below, or I think we got that link over to you if someone wants to schedule around the business credit, but. Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Prime Corporate Services. Feel free to follow us for a tax tip of the week. And we need to do this again. Thank you for having me. It was great talking with both of you. And we need we need to do more of this. This has been fun. Yeah, yeah Tommy. Thank you. We're, yeah, we appreciate you taking your time. Folks, if you're watching Prime Corporate Services, make sure to follow them. Keep up with it. Building your business credit profile is essential for your business's success. and you don't need to go in alone. Again, find Tommy at, Cor at Prime Corporate Services. Thanks so much, Tommy. We appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, Tommy. Talk to you soon. All right, well, everybody. With that, that is our episode. Make sure to be with us next week. Uh, the title of next week's episode is That's a Wrap Agreement. We're talking about wrap agreements. Make sure to be with us. We'll be talking with attorney Alan Keshker. Thanks so much. We'll see you next week, guys. Have a good day, everyone.